with sunlight, the poetry and laughter. Hostile in the desert, but somehow I'm not alone. Good morning, and welcome to the Vallejo Drive Church Online Adult Sabbath School Bible Study. We're so glad you joined us today. We've been going through a great study in the book of Hebrews this quarter, and it's been such a blessing to see how Jesus' ministry is unfolding right before our very eyes. And so we're excited to see and learn how Jesus right now is ministering to each one of us, all of us around the world. And so today we're going to be looking at Jesus Opens the Way Through the Veil. So I invite you to bow your heads with me as we have a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, our heavenly priest, our Savior, the Lamb of God, creator of the universe and the creator of us, thank you for being with us today. I pray that you will speak personally and powerfully to each one of us as we open up your word and as your spirit moves and transforms our very lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, let's start with our Bible verse, our memory verse for this week, and it goes like this. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Jesus' ascension into heaven 40 days after he rose from the grave 
was Jesus entering into a new phase of his ministry. He became the high priest in heaven. There is a heavenly sanctuary that the Bible says is not made by human hands. God has this temple, this sanctuary there. And our earthly sanctuary in the Old Testament was a copy of that. And God gave a copy and showed a model, in a sense, in the Hebrew word to Moses and to the artisans and the craftsmen that God imbued with the Spirit with the ability to create. Isn't that an amazing gift? You know, we often talk about gifts of of the Spirit, gifts of studying, of sharing, of wisdom, of teaching, of different kinds of ministries in the church. But we can't overlook the artisan gifts, the gifts of creation, creating things with our hands, building with our hands. And so we have the sanctuary in the Old Testament, and we have the priests who minister daily on behalf of the people who came to bring the sacrifices to the priest, and the sacrifices then were cut and they collected the blood and sprinkled it in there, symbolically transferring the sins of the people to the sanctuary. But then once a year, Day of Atonement, there was a high priest, and they would actually take uh, the, the elders of the of the Israel would lay their hands on the Lord's ram, cut his throat, take the blood, go into the most near the most holy place and sprinkle backwards from the inner inner compartment to the outer, symbolizing the covering of sin by the Lord's ram and the sins being cleansed and being brought out of the sanctuary. That by itself is a great study for us to go through sometime. But just to give a little recap, there was this important sanctuary system, and the priest had an important role. And in that important role, the priest was a mediator. He was the one between the people as they were praying and fasting at the entrance on the Day of Atonement, and as the priest would go in with the smoke from the altar of incense that would go over the the veil from the holy place into the most holy place as a way to say, Lord, I trust you. I'm going to follow your ways to come before you. I'm going to do it the way you said it, God. And that's how they would come into God's presence. So the only way that Israel could come to God was through the sanctuary system, through the high priest on the special day. And as Jesus went up into heaven, even in his, before that, even his death, even his resurrection, all of these things calm, were actually the culmination of the different activities that the priest, uh, his function and his role would be. So, for example, the lesson points out that there was a pilgrimage that the male Israelites would take three times a year. They would go on the day of preparation. There would be also symbolizing the priest waving the barley sheaf uh, as first fruits and also the day of Pentecost. And they would take these journeys and go to Jerusalem and to, for a spiritual pilgrimage. And Jesus, in Jesus dying on the day of preparation, Jesus rising on the third day, symbolically, as, as the priest would later, after the day of preparation, would wave the sheaves, barley sheaves, before God as a first fruits. And then the day of Pentecost, when Jesus ascended to heaven on the right hand of God. What's interesting is Jesus fulfilled all these pilgrimages that the Israelites made. He fulfilled the prophecy that were made about him. There are so many prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. We want to look at the goal of the pilgrimage that the Israelites went on three times a year to Jerusalem. What is the goal? What, why, what's the destination? Is it just to go to say some prayers? Is it just to go to do a sacrifice in Jerusalem? Is it to go to get some good food in the city that they normally don't get in their town? Well, actually, as we look at it, There's a verse that kind of clues us in. It's in Psalms 42, verse 2, and it says this. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? The author of the psalm is is expressing the sentiment and desire of being in God's very presence. Not just doing the rituals, not just involved in serving, not just involved in activities, but actually being in the presence of God of God, to be in communion with God, to be connected and close to God. And what's interesting is that there's the journey and the destination of the journey, right? Well, the destination is to be in God's presence, but as we live life, as we're on life's journey, we want to actually be in God's presence every moment of every day. This is our privilege through the power of the Holy Spirit and what Jesus has done for us on the cross, that God wants us to be in constant communion 
with him, to be ever in his presence day by day. I also want you to imagine the joy of Jesus. When he ascended into heaven after being on this earth for a while and ministering to his believers after his resurrection, that Jesus went to heaven and ascended there to take on this new role of our mediator, our our minister, the one who is ministering to us right now from heaven above. And as Jesus is there, that when he first gets to heaven, I wonder, did he run to the Father? Did the Father run? Did they embrace? Did the, was there a cheer from the angels? What did the Holy Spirit tell him? It's exciting to, to consider how there was this reunion again where Jesus can be before the Father, just as the psalmist expressed, he wanted to be in God's presence. This is the goal of our lives, to be in God's presence, because that's what we were created for. I don't know about you, but there's, a, there's lots of reasons people want to go to heaven. But for me, I want to go to heaven. I want to live this eternal life because I want to see what God intended for us. I'm curious to see what God created us for, for eternity. What's that going to be like to be in His presence? To be right there face to face with God. That's what I'm excited to experience. And I hope you and I will be on that journey together and encourage one another along the way. Well, as we take a look at another part of this week's lesson, the question rises, what's the need for a veil? In the Old Testament system, there was a veil uh, that was surrounding the courtyard where the sanctuary was. There was a veil for the entrance. There was a veil between the holy place and the most holy place. And only certain people could go into the courtyard. And from there, only certain people can go through the entrance. And only there, once a year, only a certain person, the high priest, could go into the most holy place. Well, these things were given as a protection for the people. I remember reading the Bible, and you'll find in the story Moses, when he went up to see God on Mount Sinai. And oftentimes when he would uh, meet God at the, tent, at the tent, when they were marching and going on their way to the promised land, and there were times that Moses faced, he was spending so much time with God, it was so bright that people said, put a veil on. They didn't have sunglasses like we have today to block out the light. But that would have been a different kind of light the light of God's presence, the light of God's holiness. And to protect them from this bright, shining light of holiness, God actually put around the sanctuary, he had the, around the the courtyard, he actually put the Levites to live, while the other uh, tribes were encamped around them, and at the center was the tabernacle. So if we read Numbers, verse 53, it says this, But the Levites shall camp around the tabernacle of the testimony, so that there may be no wrath on the congregation of the people of Israel. And the Levites shall keep guard over the tabernacle of the testimony. So the reason why there were these veils, the reason why God put a buffer of Levites around them between the tabernacle and the encampment of the different tribes is to protect the people. Remember, the priesthood, they were the mediators between the people And God. Even on the Day of Atonement, the people would stand out there in front of the tabernacle and and fasting and praying, and the mediator, the priest, would mediate between them and God and pray on their behalf, or God may give them a message to give to the people. Whatever it was, there was a buffer. Which brings us to the next question of this week's study, which is But there is a new veil. So, what's interesting is heaven gave us a new veil. We no longer have the veils of an outer court or the veils of the entrance to a temple, or the veils between the holy and the most holy place where only certain individuals could go. No, we have a veil that every believer is given access to go through to experience for themselves in God's own presence to be before the Lord, to have a personal relationship with Him. This is what God is up to. This is what God desires. And what is this new veil? What is this new way? Well, Hebrews 10, 19-22 gives us this picture. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He consecrated for us through the veil, that is, His flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. This is an amazing truth and an amazing invitation. The truth is, Jesus, who was the Messiah, who came to this earth, who fulfilled the prophecies at his birth, and fulfilled even before his birth, and then at his birth, and then growing up, and then and his ministry, 
the prophecies that the Old Testament put forth that the people could read and look forward to the fulfillment in the Messiah and Jesus fulfilling the prophecy of being sacrificed for the sins of the people. He was a sacrificial lamb, the lamb of God. When John the Baptist was ministering to the people near the river and his disciples saw Jesus, he, he points to Jesus and said, there's a lamb that take away, taketh away the sins of the world. And his disciples would then go follow Jesus. That was the point of John the Baptist's ministry, was to point people to Jesus. And he was okay. He was humble to say, I must decrease while he increases. He pointed people to Jesus because Jesus' ministry was better than his own. Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. And so here we have Jesus fulfilling Bible prophecy. And in fulfilling Bible prophecy as a sacrifice, he also fulfilled Bible prophecy as the high priest. And that's the central theme of Hebrews. That's where Hebrews is getting us to, is Jesus' role as high priest, as our Savior, as the one who is now sharing with us the blessings and moving ministry into our lives to transform us and to ensure that by His power we're going to all make our pilgrimage to the heavenly kingdom. So Jesus Himself is the new and living way by which we get to go to God. It's no accident that when Jesus died on the cross, that there's this very significant moment happening at the same time in the temple. And in that moment, this large, thick curtain that separates the holy from the most holy place is torn from the top all the way down to the bottom. Human hands could not tear that curtain. That was a divine act. And in that divine act, when Jesus died, it was saying, by His blood, when you accept Christ into your life, when you embrace Him as your Savior and receive His character, all that He wants to give you of Himself in your life, and you're saved, and you have that assurance of salvation, you have a direct link to God. You don't have to go through a priest. You don't have to go through a pastor. You don't have to go through a nun. You don't have to go through giving offerings into the church. You don't have to do something or say something that gets you into heaven. What we are called to do is receive Jesus' words, to receive Jesus' sacrifice, to receive Jesus' ministry into our lives. And you and I get to go to heaven because it's through Jesus' blood, the Bible says, that you and I get to go through this veil directly to God. Jesus is our mediator, and He's already done it. So we have the blessing of being in God's presence every single day. This is our good news. Through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, through His blood shed for us, through Him taking our sins upon Himself, and in, our, in that place He gives us His righteousness, Jesus being resurrected and becoming our high priest in heaven, we, we become partakers of that salvation. And we get to live with God, starting now, from now until eternity. I love this image of the, the veil being torn from the top down because God is saying there is nothing that can separate us, separate you from my love, God says. There is nothing that's going to stand in the way. No person, no institution, no acts of kindness or goodness on your part. God says it's all what Jesus did. He made the way. This is a beautiful promise that we read. And as we continue reading through the book of Hebrews, this is our last month in March, that we're going to read through this, uh, well, not through the book of Hebrews only, but this theme that we have found in the Hebrews before we get to a really exciting study coming up in our second quarter. But my invitation to you today is this, for all of us to accept the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for you and I, to trust that God took our shame of our sins, took the guilt of our sins, and put that all on Jesus. And that in, in, a, in their place, we get Jesus' righteousness in our own lives. I invite you to, to choose to believe that today and to ask the Holy Spirit to cement that belief inside of your mind and your heart and that you will experience the living God transforming your life as I pray that He will transform my own. And that we will walk together the pilgrimage that, yes, we have the destination of God's presence now, 
but we also still on a pilgrimage to see him face to face like Jesus did when he ascended to heaven. When God brings us in the clouds of glory and meets us there in the air, that we get to be with Jesus for all eternity. This is a wonderful promise. This is the foundation of our salvation. And we can confidently walk in the world, not in our confidence, but in the confidence that Jesus has kept his word, has fulfilled all the Bible prophecies, and is walking with us in this pilgrimage to heaven. Let us pray. God, we commit to you our lives. We have sinned. We have fallen short of your glory. Our sins have hurt not only our relationship with you, but our relationship with other people. God, we thank you for forgiving us of those sins. We thank you for taking them on the cross and dying in our place. And that when you shed your blood, you provided a new veil, a new way for us to break through the sin and darkness of this world into your marvelous light, into your kingdom. Father, thank you for giving us the assurance and the pledge of that kingdom now. We are citizens of heaven, walking through and passing through the earth, awaiting for the King of Kings to come back to take us home. Lord, I pray that any of us who struggle with sin or struggle with this belief, that, Lord, you would gently speak to our hearts and do what only you can do to transform us into people of faith and joy and trust. This we ask humbly, thanking you for all these gifts you've given to us. In your name we pray. Amen. May you have a blessed Sabbath day. May you walk in the assurance of salvation, what Jesus already did for you, and what he's doing as our heavenly priest ministering to us now. May you find that you have a Father and a Savior and a Holy Spirit and all of heaven on your side, walking you into heaven. Have a blessed Sabbath day.